add your video and then you get the analysis of it. So that's not super cheap still. So that's nine dollar for an hour of video uh, per video. So I think that's it from my side for the last month's news. Um, and over to you, Mr. Sam, if you're the next one. Yes. Okay, welcome everyone. Here I'm Sam, uh, I'm a principal consultant with DAPJ Company. So we are yeah, doing we are one of the Microsoft practices in Australia and doing all the Microsoft STEM consulting work. Uh, more of along the updates. So if we look at after build, all, all the updates and announcements coming after build, if we review all, looks like Microsoft Azure Monitor team was the busiest team after build and Apparently, because it wasn't the dev stuff, so they continuing all the stuff. Uh, lots of the uh, updates and announcements uh, are coming from their team. Uh, we picked up something from the public review and GA. So the first one is the pod sand, pod sandboxing, uh, which is the pod sandboxing feature itself is in preview for the AKS. And basically, it's adding another layer of the isolation from the kernel and from the host. We sandboxing the pod itself inside, inside the cluster. Now monitoring and basically sending all the metrics and uh, logs and everything into container inside within the Azure Monitor is supported and added to the feature as well. Both the still in preview. Uh, if you if you are following the, the managed report and managed Prometheus features within the Azure Monitor, so now they added the private endpoint to the managed report now, and that's it. Uh, that's very good for enterprises. It's still in preview, but good in terms of um, your managed Grafana workspace can connect to all the different Azure data sources in a private network, in your private virtual network, and then going through the public internet. And all your data uh, traveling between your managed Grafana workspace and all of the data sources and all the logs and metrics. Uh, happen in your uh, private virtual networking, uh, uh, which is a big advantage, and uh, most of the enterprises probably trying to implement that one. Uh, it's been tested with a couple of data sources the Azure Monitor, MPLS itself, SQL Server, Cosmos DB, and two other connectors already tested by Microsoft in the preview feature, and I believe more, of, more data sources will be added to that as well. Network observability add-on on APS is another very interesting feature added as an add-on to the APS. And if you're familiar with the add-on on the APS, is basically big advantage is you don't need to worry about those add-ons. So Microsoft will handle all those uh, update installation, configuration, and everything in the cluster for you. Network observ observability is a uh, is a, is a new add-on uh, on the cluster, and by enabling that add-on, basically you enable the full end-to-end -end network monitoring across your cluster. And basically, it sits at the node level, at the node pool level, and by monitoring all the metrics and everything at the node level, and works for the, both of the Linux and uh, Windows containers and node pools as well, and by uh, basically, monitoring and grabbing metrics for, from all the networking services, uh, from all the nodes, and sending all those metrics into Azure Monitor, and you get a deep insight into how your networking stuff is working across the cluster. And the big advantage is basically uh, Microsoft will add, again, some ML and AI into that one, and basically it gives you proactive uh, actions in terms of uh, preventing or fixing some errors and uh, something that it reckons that it's going to happen soon in terms of degrading the networking performance or any upcoming issues in the networking to minimize any outage and uh, performance issue for you and you can proactively action on those items as well. So if, if you are working with APS, definitely encourage to uh, get your hands on, on that one and give it a try. Azure Virtual Network Encryption, again, is another layer of encryption added to the virtual network itself. So that means encryption is happening across all the Azure backbone from one virtual network to another virtual network. So 
uh, that already exists and in the Azure platform within the Azure Data Center as well. But that's another layer, which means within the same virtual network and with, between subnets and even different uh, devices within the same subnet, the encryption happen and um, uh, you can enable that one in the it's in preview and you can start. Uh, probably nothing you can observe, but you can enable to make sure uh, you get another layer of the encryption if needed. And the big news, I'm sure everyone is bombarded with that one <laughs> since yesterday. So one of those, <laughs> I would say marketing stuff <laughs> probably it's, yeah. no, honestly, it's, it's been around for 12 months. So that, that, that's not something uh, happened all in a sudden. But Microsoft decided to rebrand the Azure AD into Microsoft Intro ID. And it's not just the rebranding. So a few other things is happening as a part of that rebranding. And Microsoft is trying to unify all the identity and security products under one product and, and under the Microsoft Intro ID. So currently, uh, everything you get from the Azure AD is already included in Intro ID. Uh, for example, workload identities and everything you do uh, uh, are already included and unified as part of the Microsoft Entry ID. The only service that's not included in the Entry ID is the Azure ADB2C. So Azure ADB2C still remains as Azure services separated from Entry ID. There is a concept of external ID in the Entry ID, which B2C will be transitioned over time into external ID, but in terms of the features and capability, it's very limited compared to B2C. So that that's, doesn't mean a replacement for the B2C. And the good news for you and for customers is no action required. So you just keep using Azure AD, in Azure AD as you do today, and yeah, basically business as usual. Uh, there is a plan for this. Pizza no, I think pizza somewhere. <laughs> Someone is calling me. Uh, yeah, so for the data plan by Microsoft for the second half of the um, this year in 2023 to update and propagate and roll out all the changes to documentation and all other services. And yeah, get yourself familiar with this terminology with this new product name and what's in, included there because in the next six months it's they're, they're, they're gonna be a chaos <laughs> everywhere one Azure AD. And another update again, big big and important one from Azure Monitor is basically they enable uh, the manage identity integration with the container inside for all your container workloads. Uh, and using a managed identity for the authentication. Uh, one of the big ones, probably again, is for the AKS and cluster. So if you are running the AKS and is that still using the service principle, the old way you used to create the AKS cluster, it's highly recommended to migrate them to managed identity. And uh, because it's coming everywhere in the agnostic cluster and anywhere you are uh, running the Kubernetes cluster, so it's better to take action today and upgrade all those clusters to manage identity. And now, uh, if you have a managed identity enabled cluster, it can uh, it, it use that one for authentication between the cluster and between the Azure Monitor services for sending all the data metrics to container insights. That's it for me. Cool. Yeah. Uh, this is a video that we put in mind. Is everyone yeah. supposed to be for the AP? Next slide. I feel kind of uh, un undress underdressed now because uh, the other two guys uh, who got synthesized last night have put a lot more stuff on this. Um, but I've only got three items to talk about. Um, so a lot of people get put out by stuff being retired in Azure. Sometimes it's just like features of certain services. Um, and if you don't have operations in your business that is, you know, working with Cloud briefly, maybe they're still on the adoption path to it. Um, maybe they missed some of those changes over time. Uh, and I certainly know that there's been some customers that have been bitten quite hard by um, 
things in the, in uh, Azure that have been retired that they missed the announcement for and they've continued to consume it. And then obviously, um, retirement doesn't happen the day after it gets announced. It's usually a minimum of 12 months. Uh, but if you don't see it, you know, half a dozen times, you probably will never see it. Uh, the good thing is Microsoft uh, is doing something about that. So uh, with Azure Advisor, they've now got a workbook uh, that will track retirement announcements uh, and give you a very specific view about what that means for your estate in Azure. So it's not just a generic, here's all the things that are being retired. It's uh, here's all the things that are being retired that relate to you, uh, which is really important. So that's in preview at the moment. So if you use Azure Advisor, uh, you can actually uh, go and open that workbook up today and see if anything in your uh, Azure subscription or subscriptions um, is affected by upcoming retirements, um, which I will talk about one of uh, after I talk about the next one. So uh, Microsoft DevBox is uh, a really cool offering for dev workstations in the cloud. So hands up if you know what GitHub code spaces are. A few people, okay. Uh, who knows what DevBox is? Similar people, all right. Um, so. Uh, Codespaces solves a really good uh, cloud-based development environment problem for, um, I guess, more modern applications, uh, things that would work on a Linux environment, maybe you're building microservices to be deployed uh, to, say, Kubernetes, or you're building, say, a Node.js uh, web application or um, a web application server-side rendered uh, that can be basically run up in like a, a local node uh, server. Codespaces is really good at that. Uh, what it's not really good at is if you've got more traditional heavyweight applications that might do things like device drivers or require specific hardware, uh, all that are tied to Windows because, believe it or not, a lot of people still build software uh, either for or on Windows. I mean, hard to believe, but uh, here we are. Um, so Microsoft identified that as the kind of gap. Um, yes, there are virtual desktop offerings uh, like Azure BDI uh, or Windows 365, but they're really aimed at kind of the more uh, traditional uh, office worker doing things like Word documents uh, and those sorts of things. And typically, if you try and use those for uh, dev scenarios, the number one complaint you get from devs is these things behave like jobs and they're terrible because uh, they don't have the performance hardware sitting underneath them. Uh, DevBox solves that by focusing the deployment of DevBoxes onto higher end hardware. Uh, it still sits on top of Windows 365. Uh, it's a quite an interesting. Uh, interesting way they've delivered the service, um, but the secret sauce on top of that is that uh, you'll be able, you can build blessed machine images already and publish them and consume them for dev boxes, uh, but you will be able to customize them. So the customization is just named as a private preview. Uh, it uses either Chocolatey or Winget um, to allow you to customize the machines once they're deployed uh, into your enterprise. Um, it is probably more of an enterprise product uh, than a small business product because it has about half a dozen various licenses that are tied to spinning it up. Um, one for Windows, one for Windows 365, one for Azure AD, Entra ID, I'm oh, sorry, uh, premium, a bunch of different licenses that go along with it. So it's not just a point and click solution, uh, which is what Codespaces really is, but it's uh, super interesting for large enterprises that maybe have uh, large offshore teams or um, people who like to work from home. Um, it went GA, I could talk more about it. Um, I think it's a really interesting product. Um, maybe I'll do a session again, I did one last year, um, but maybe now it's GA, we'll revisit it. Uh, and then the only other one I'll talk about is Azure Media Services. So this may not be a service you've ever heard of. Hands up if you've heard of Azure Media Services before. Two people, and at least one of those people I'd expect to know about it, given that he runs the uh, meetup. I'm sure if Arafat was out here talking, uh, he would be sent up as well. Uh, so Media Services has been around for a while, I want to say 2015, 2016, something like that. I had some big bangs, it hosted a couple of the Winter Olympics, basically they ran all media streaming services on top of it. Um, interestingly, when the MDA moved on to Azure, they didn't choose to use uh, Media Services for all their streaming needs, it's basically based uh, on custom solutions that run on top of uh, AKS. Uh, consequently, it seems Microsoft is no longer investing in Media Services and will be retiring it. Uh, in the middle of next year. Uh, it's probably the first really big service retirement that's happened probably for well over five years. Um, given the fact that no one put their hand up in this room, it probably shows you uh, the impact that it will probably have uh, across the board. Um, 
but here we are. I thought I would mention it because it's kind of like a big bang in the time. We haven't really had uh, one of those for a while. I can't even think of the last time we had uh, service retirement on that scale. Maybe some of the original uh, identity stuff um, that was in there. All right, enough of me talking. We'll have Rodney in a moment. Um, there are pizzas at the back. There are three boxes on the end of the table. So if you're facing the table on the left, those three boxes appear to be vegetarian. I'm now vegetarian. Two boxes in the middle are chicken, and the two boxes on the end are bacon, I think, of some sort. Bacon? Yeah. Bacon. We'll say bacon. It looks like bacon. Maybe it's bacon, but you know, if you're a vegetarian, don't, don't eat it, because it's probably bacon. Uh, so vegetarian, chicken, bacon, go to it. And uh, we'll say, what are we now? And how small is your font? I know my eyesight is bad, but it's not that bad. Um, Let's say we'll start again in 15 minutes. So um, we'll yell at you when that's time. So you've got 15 minutes to get into the pizza and have some drinks. Things are wrong. You can pause the recording. It's fine. Just turn off the just turn off the camera. It's fine.
your camera done that. Okay. Awesome. And this one. Can I just test that, yeah. It wasn't working fast. Trying to go to that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, so I'm a bit. Uh, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay, everyone, it's 10 to 7. So, if, all right, if everyone agrees, please get back to see if we can continue the networking after. Guys, when you're ready, could you take your seats, please? We'll be starting in a second. Yeah, be good to go, guys. Please, if you can get back to your seat and give it a start. Okay, so everyone had some good pizza there. I've got a few slices in. Um, so today's uh, topic is about building a FinOps culture in your organization. And I've had some really good conversations right now about what FinOps is. And uh, I think it's going to be quite an interesting talk. It's a little higher level than normal. Um, we don't have to go too technical. Uh, so a bit about me. Um, Sorry, just going to get my notes up quickly, because I'll forget what to say. <laughs> Who am I? There we go. Um, so my name is Rodney Joyce. I'm the Managing Director of Cloud Monitor. Um, I've been using .NET, and, uh, well, using .NET since year 2000. I'm a developer at heart. Um, using Azure since about... 
2014, and I say Azure because I deal with a lot of Americans, I've just given up on saying Azure. Um, and uh, thanks to, to Sam and Arafat and uh, uh, Simon for having me here. Really appreciate the, the effort you guys make in the community. Um, I was supposed to be here a month ago, but I had a COVID-like um, flu. It wasn't quite COVID, it was worse than COVID, but it floored me, but I'm fine now. Um, okay, so feel free to connect with me with the LinkedIn QR code on the top right. I'll share these slides afterwards um, through the uh, user group channels. Um, feel free to send me any questions you have, uh, uh, if you have any. Um, so a bit about Cloud Monitor. Um, we're an open source FinOps platform for Azure. And um, basically we have a FinOps product, a Microsoft licensing product, security product, and a sustainability product that's currently vaporware, uh, but it's in, it's in POC phase. And it uh, helps you measure your carbon emissions at business unit level. And we have all of these tools for MSPs and CSPs as well. And they talk to the Cloud Monitor engine, which is doing recommendations, cost anomalies, uh, all sorts of goodness. Um, and there's a team spot for real-time alerting and an admin application where you can set up your business units. Um, if you want to see a demo of this product, I won't be talking about it. Uh, you can go to cloudmonitor.ai and uh, see an online demo and, and uh, download it from GitHub if you want to, if you want to uh, have a go at it. This is the type of reporting that we do, so uh, it's all white labeled and uh, the key difference here is that you've got your cost group, which is your business unit, so same costs at your business unit level. Uh, there's, there's a heap of reports. Okay, so um, who here thinks they know what Finox is? And don't be shy, there's a small group, it's all good friendly here. Um, so who knows what Finox is? You guys do the best talking. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so it's interesting. It's it's a, it's quite an unknown topic. It's not the dynamics financial operations product. Um, when people think of FinOps, they think about uh, right sizing things and lowering costs. And that's my next question. Who here thinks that FinOps is all about reducing cloud costs? And I don't have to answer. Uh, it's actually not about reducing cloud costs. So um, we still want people to spend money in the cloud, but we want to get a better return on investment and business value for the cloud spend that's made. Um, so currently there's lots of wastage, and I'm going to go into to more detail, detail on this. Okay, so um, to understand what FinOps is, let's first start with the problem and the drivers as to how we're at this point, the problem with cloud. So, Think about your organizations and your businesses. Can you answer these common questions? So imagine the CFO or the CIO comes to you or the program manager and says, whatever your role is, and they say to you, um, which business unit should a cost be charged to? Or how much does it cost to operate a given product in your business? How much revenue did a particular product or business unit uh, um, generate for the organization? Which cloud services can be turned off without impacting production? And how much will a data platform cost in a year's time? So, cost estimation. Now, if you think about these, they're actually really difficult questions to answer. And there's a very good reason for that. It's because we're not really tracking these things. We're not really tracking Technical cloud spend, the amount we spend on cloud services against the business, uh, the business value that is generating for the business. Okay, so we, we're not linking those two things together. And this this highlights some of the problem with the OPEX cloud. So um, you think about OPEX, it's, it's uh, the operating cost versus CapEx, which is the capital cost. CapEx costs are upfront, it's budget for. Operating costs are on as you go, as you go. So let's take a step back and think about uh, why cloud costs spiral out of control. And this will help us understand what uh, what FinOps does. Now, first of all, we're on the cloud for a reason. Otherwise, we'll just go back to the data centers of the world. We're on the cloud because it gives us scalability on demand, it gives us PAYG pricing, so we can do things like experiment with 
cool new features like open AI uh, at a very low cost. In the past, we have to, um, you know, uh, get a massive server, uh, huge amounts of RAM, hardware, and CPU, do our experiments, and get left with a server. Now we can run an experiment, do a PAC, and turn it off. Um, it's quite incredible how much uh, value the cloud could bring. With back power comes back responsibility, and these are the problems that we have. So, um, with the cloud, we have a lack of visibility uh, of, of spend, and there's three different levels of this. There's at the very bottom, you've got the developers, the technical users who are spinning up resources. Now, every single resource that a developer makes uh, has, a, has a cost impact. So, developers are making uh, micro buying decisions every time they make something. And it's very intangible, it's all virtual, it's very hard to realize that you're actually somewhere in the other side of the world or in your region, there's a VM actually sitting there. It's a physical machine that you're renting for a period of time. But often the developers are not aware of the cost impact. So I do lots of tech interviews, uh, and often I'll ask the question, you know, what, what size uh, app services are running on? What size SQL database was that on? And half the time, developers cannot tell me what size it was. They either say, I don't know, uh, or they say, um, that was the ops team that, that figured that out to me. Um, and the ops team, that, that's fine, but the ops team don't have the business context as to why it's a certain size. They're thinking, they don't have the, the context of the developer has. Okay, it also, if you use the CLI, it might default the, the SKU uh, of a certain resource type. Um, the portal's not exactly uh, flashing the warning or the, the cost in your face. Uh, it, it, it looks the same whether you spin up a, a $250,000 fabric instance or a $200 fabric instance. There's no flashing warning signs that you're about to spend a quarter of a million dollars a month. Um, going up a level, you've got the, the business unit owners. So if you think about uh, a big organization, um, there's a product manager, program manager, uh, business unit owner, whatever you want to call them, who's sponsoring this project. And they've got this idea and it's going to generate some sort of business value for your company, um, hopefully, that's why we do business. Uh, but it's going to have a cost, and it's going to be a labor cost, it's going to be cloud technical services cost, etc. etc. And they also don't know exactly how much they pay because they, they don't get very clear visibility on how much, it, how much it's going to cost and how much it's going to cost in a year's time. I'm talking about there, there are definitely companies that have this solved, but we're talking about the majority of companies here. Okay. And the last one for visibility is the CFOs. So the CFO gets the bill at the end of the month, or whenever they get the bill, and it's this aggregated figure, you know, millions of dollars, and uh, it's um, they go into the details of things like egress. And I guarantee you that the, the, the accountant doesn't know what the is. They don't know the subscriptions, they don't know the resource groupers, they never heard of Synapse or Databricks, and they don't really care. To be they just care are they getting business value for the month that they pay? And they don't know. Um, the CFO's job, the, the financial team's job, is to take that cloud bill and say, okay, well, I charge back this bit to that part of the business, this bit to that business unit, this bit to that business unit, uh, and ideally that amount that we spend generates a lot more income coming in. That's not currently happening. So there's this disconnect between the people who are spinning up the resources, the engineers, and the people who are paying the bills, or the, the finance team or the procurement team. And not only is there a, uh, a contextual difference, you know, that they're talking different languages, one's talking finance, one's talking tech, um, there's a time delay. So I my uh, database cluster today, and in six weeks' time, that cluster will be running for six weeks. Someone will get a bill saying, you know, you now owe ten thousand dollars, and that person has no idea why or who who paid it or who talked to about it. There's this rather large disconnect, and as usual, the lack of governance uh, is the root of all evil here. So, understanding simple things like who paid the resource, why they why they paid it, and when they paid it. But those are the three simple things I can think of. Um, many systems in the cloud don't show you that. If you think about some of the systems that you work on today, you can't actually see that information. Um, the other part of governance is things like, uh, you know, good CAF, the cloud architecture framework principles, like have you got your uh, resources tagged for you? Um, have you got processes around tagging? I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. 
We also find that in the cloud, before FinOps, organizations are not empowering people to optimize the cloud spend. Now, um, I'm going to use an example. I won't mention the customer's name, but um, about three years ago, uh, we were doing some, a consulting project, not in the film space, in the data space, for a government agency. And we, we noticed that data lakes into the side of our project, and we, we could see it was generating a lot of wastage. Uh, so we said to the program manager, we'll, we'll spend two weeks just looking at low hanging fruit and give you a report. Um, in two weeks, we lowered, lowered the cost from 500,000 to 280,000. So $120,000 a euro in two weeks of effort for one person. So $15,000 consulting cost. We took that report and we went and knocked on all these different doors in that organization. And we're like, hey, do you want us to do this for your product or your business? We got no response. We couldn't um, reach the right people to say, well, it's a no brainer. If I'm saving $100,000 or 15,000 spent, that's a no brand right? Um, but the point was, we were, we were coming from the bottom up. We we're trying to get buy-in to do this, whereas what we've learned is that we don't come from the top down. This, the the C-level execs never say, this makes sense, I want to optimize my cloud spend. Um, it's, it's very hard paying from the bottom up. Now, this is a topic that we're discussing earlier as well. The core business of the cloud vendors, AWS, Google, Alibaba, uh, Azure, is Azure consumption energy or consumption energy. So they want to understand that. that is their core business model. So if you look at the Azure portal, it's really, really good. It's got amazing features, it's got amazing APIs, um, but all of it's turned off by default. The budget is off by default, the nominee is off by default. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to make any suggestions, but you know it could be more help. It could be turned on money point. Um, so uh, you know we have to remember that uh, moving to the cloud is not necessarily going to save us money. Um, that's a myth that moving to the cloud saves money. It's it's uh, scalable, but not automatically going to lower your costs. And the other thing with the Azure portal, the Azure portal, no business user has ever logged into the Azure portal. It's a technical user interface. Techies love it, so it's a great I personally like it very much. But um, no program manager or accountant or CFO has ever logged in and figured out what's going on. They get scared off. Um, and garbage in, garbage out. So if you haven't got a good foundation, and this is really ties into uh, governance, if you haven't got a good foundation on your tagging on your, your, your cloud footprint, it's really hard to work out who should be paying for things and allocating those costs back. So if you think about tags, it's the current best solution that we have in the cloud. And I think it's uh, it's a feature that's across all the different clouds. It's a name value string pair that has no semantic value. Side talk, okay? um, that has no semantic value unless you have a, a process around it. So for example, if I put a tag on a resource saying great buy on you. If I don't do anything else, um, okay, that's that's an easy one actually. Let's say owned by Rodney. If, if I leave the company, if nothing changes, that tag is immediately stale. It's bad information. Oftentimes, um, stale information is worse than no information. <laughs> At least you know there's no information. You don't know if something's stale or not. So you need to enforce processes around your tags. And then uh, I mentioned this earlier the lack of developer awareness. Um, I'm a developer myself. There's developers, you know, we we, um, we don't like to listen to other people's rules and, and, and all these kind of things. We like to just develop. Um, but currently, there's no accountability. We're not held accountable. So even in my team, I've got people who are working on a fast product. We spin up a database cluster and they leave it running. And I get a two thousand dollar bill. And I'm like, guys, we're building a fast product. Surely you can turn off the cluster. And we, we actually built a recommendation to Cloud Monitor for exactly that. If you snip that in cluster, if you don't turn it off, it says, are you sure you meant to leave this running? That was a personal rule that I put in. Um, so even the smartest developers make mistakes. It's not about uh, stopping the developers. It's not about um, preventing them from doing things. Because you're going you're gonna to stifle the innovation if you say you cannot do anything. 
Um, and it's, not, it's also not about sitting over their shoulder like Big Brother and watching them. It's about um, having the business unit uh, being accountable for the cost and having the visibility and having the guardrails to say that if someone makes a mistake, we can catch that quickly, as opposed to uh, it might never get caught and the cost just becomes not even what you want to Or maybe six weeks later, the CFO notices the cost spike and we spend another three weeks of effort digging into what happened, which is, which is a crazy amount of uh, labor. So it's about catching these errors quickly. And then the whole principle of the variable cloud spend of the, of the cloud. So variable cloud spend is basically all the services of different prices, they, they all the different uh, metrics, different units, um, seconds, you know, minutes. Uh, it's very hard to stay on top of this. No one person knows more. The cloud is constantly expanding all different directions. There's new services. It's very hard to expect someone to know this stuff. So we need better reporting on this. We don't want to rely on a on a on a, an individual or a human to have to track this stuff. We want to have better reporting and controls. Okay, so so when did this happen? You know that, that sounds that sounds terrible, but um, when did this happen? And, uh, and is it worth the benefits? So I just reiterate: we're on the cloud because we want the scalability and KYG, but uh, KYG nature. Um, it provides lots of business value. But if we look at what happened, we used to be on data centers and on-prem, and we had this capex cost. Uh, so um, even I remember this from like 2013. We were in a dev team, and we we're hitting the limits on our a simple database, we bought this massive uh, virtual machine in the data center, and um, it was five hundred thousand dollars or something, and that lasted us for two years. But because it's a one-off cost, it went through a approval process, um, and for a long time, the majority of that compute power was unused. Um, compare that to the OPEX world, where there's no cost, and then you can buy something, and then you you incur that cost as you go. Okay. So that's OPEX versus CAPEX. In the CAPEX world, you had that approval process. Your finance team got involved, your managers got involved, the whole organization got involved and said, yes, this makes sense from a business point of view. In the cloud world, there's none of that. It's like if everything is not, if nothing's turned off, your developers can go and spin up anything they want and someone else will pay for it. Um, reducing your consumption in the CAPEX world has no effect. So in that example I mentioned, we had this $500,000 server. If we did use it or didn't use it, it didn't matter. The cost was sunk. Whereas in the OPEX world, there's great incentive to reduce your capacity. Um, scaling down directly saves money. Um, when you have a fixed CAPEX cost, it's much easier to budget and predict uh, your capacity planning. Whereas with, with uh, with OPEX and uh, variable capacity, it's very hard to predict, especially if your reports are uh, and your visibility is, is, is low. Uh, I'll get to that in a second. So in the CAPEX world, you don't need frequent cost reporting because it's a it's a past cost. Whereas in the in the OPEX world, you need uh, as granular reporting as you can, I need it down to the hour. Um, and uh, the costs vary drastically, but that's also got the challenge of multi-cloud, bringing together all these different recordings uh, from different clouds together and making sense of it. So these are the different uh, um, comparisons between the on-prem world and the cloud world, um, and, and this is what changed. So, so what is the solution to all the problems that I mentioned on the previous slide, because uh, we still want the benefit of the cloud, what's the solution? We need a new operating model, and that operating model uh, is called FinOps. Now, I'm going to just state this. When you hear what FinOps is, it sounds ridiculously logical. Um, I'm, it, it is quite surprising that it hasn't come about sooner. I think it's more a case of we've been doing elements of this over the last 10 years. Now it's got a formal definition and it's got a um, it's got uh, empowerment behind it. I believe that FinOps will become as ubiquitous for the cloud as DevOps is for delivery. Um, FinOps is even a harder challenge because it's not just a delivery concern, not just a technical concern, it's a finance, business, and technical concern. Um, I'm going to take the definition of FinOps verbatim from the FinOps Foundation 
website. So their definition is Cloud Finops is an evolving cloud financial management discipline and cultural practice that enables organizations to get maximum business value by helping engineering, finance, and business teams to collaborate on data-driven spending decisions. It's not a mouthful, but if we go back and look at it, it's evolving, so it's not a, something you do once, you walk away, and it's done. If it was that simple, then it wouldn't, probably wouldn't be there. Um, it's always only evolving. Uh, it's a discipline and a cultural practice, very much like DevOps. I uh, uh, turned to um, Rob earlier about uh, organizations that are DevOps-enabled, um, have many uh, organizational benefits. They deliver products faster, their quality is higher, um, they can test quicker. There's a lot more to DevOps and ECI. It's not just a, a, a technical benefit. Um, if you read the, uh, I think it's the Phoenix project, where it's called, it's all about how DevOps enables um, organizations. So that, this is the exact same thing with FinOps. You get the whole company behind it and change the way you think as a business. And it's not about reducing costs. You can spend the same amount, reduce the wastage, um, get better ROI for the amount you spend. And the second point, it's a cross-functional issue, which is why it's so difficult, because you have to get the engineering team, the finance team, and the business team to talk to each other and collaborate. But ultimately, this is going to give, let you make data-driven spending decisions. So if I spend a million dollars on this product, it generates $5 million, that's great. I spend 300,000 and you know, it generates nothing, that's terrible. So I mentioned the Phyllis Foundation. Um, this really is uh, uh, what I want you to take note of. Um, I'm in no way affiliated with the Phyllis Foundation, um, uh, but it's the de facto kind of um, standard behind us. Uh, they came about in 2020, so three years old-ish. Um, there's around 9,000 community members around the world. This is much bigger in the States at the moment. The US are, are leading the charge on FinOps. Um, we have a smaller market share, obviously, uh, but uh, we can see you know, what, um, where this is getting. There's around 3,500 organizations in our FinOps Foundation, member organizations, and uh, they're part of the Linux Foundation. So they open source, not-for-profit, I don't know if open source is the right word, and not-for-profit, um, there's, there's no commercial gain, it's cloud agnostic. Um, this is a framework for an operating model. So they do things like um, define these terms, help educate the, the global market, and give a lot of templates and frameworks for doing FinOps. Okay, so the FinOps framework is the one thing I want you to take away from this. Um, it's FinOps.org slash framework, and it's fairly complicated. Well, actually, I will not take that back. It's not that complicated. There's a lot to it. Um, there, there's a, I'll go through different definitions now. But basically, sorry, you, um, you have the, the phases of FinOps. So you've got the informed phase, the optimized phase, and the outbreak phase. And it's not a case of you start off with the one before the other. You can start where you like. You might be more, more mature in your organization in the operating phase. You might already be optimizing uh, your reserve instances or your VMs, uh, or maybe you're really good at um, cost allocation and visibility. So this is a never-ending loop that just keeps going round and round, but you'll keep, your organization will keep maturing each of these. If we drill into these phases, um, well, let's, step, sorry, let's step back a bit first. There's six uh, key FinOS principles. The first one is that Teams need to collaborate, and I've mentioned this earlier, it's not just the engineers, it's the finance team, the engineers, and the business units. Business units. Um, number two is controversial. Everyone takes ownership for their cloud spend. So the moment your, your uh, engineers are told that they're accountable for what they're spending, they're going to sit up and take notice and be more careful what they spend. It's a fine line between stifling that innovation, so you don't want to do that, but you want everyone to be accountable for what they spend. This is interesting. There's a centralized team that drives FinOps. So, uh, excuse me, we're starting to see formations of teams in companies with a, um, you know, a, 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 a proper name, it's the FinOps team, and their, their responsibility is to enable the organization, enable the cultural practices in the organization. And 
the reason they centralize is because they span multiple business units. Um, there's some more benefits I'll mention in a second. The fourth principle is that reports need to be accessible and timely. So you can't track and optimize what you can't measure. So you have to start reporting. Um, and they've got to be to the right person at the right penalty. Decisions are made by the business value and the return on investment. And you still want to take advantage of all that good stuff that I talked about with the cloud. It's a key thing here. So if you, if you follow these six principles, you're doing finance well. Okay, so the finance framework is divided into six uh, domains. And in each domain, there's one to five uh, or so capabilities. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this because it's fairly in depth. Um, if you want to learn more, I encourage you to go to the finops.org uh, slash framework. Um, I'll give you a very high, uh, brief overview of these. So, the first domain is understanding cloud usage and costs. And again, you could start with these domains in any order, you could do the paper list in any order. Now, this concept of uh, maturity, call, walk, and run. I mean, these are all very logical principles. It's like, in this domain, uh, if you were at the run phase, you could be doing cost allocation at a very granular level. You could be doing hourly reports, charging back to the students, you're doing a great job already. If you're at the, uh, the call phase, maybe there's no reporting at all. You have no idea of the cost that you're spending. And the idea is that uh, you iterate through these capabilities and domains to keep improving your maturity level. There's an assessment on the FinOps uh, the org, um, website where you take the assessment and measure yourself in each capability to understand where you are and what needs to improve. So you can look at that if you're interested in uh, for an organization. The second domain is performance tracking and benchmarking. This is already about um, budgeting and forecasting, uh, which you really should have in your business. How much do you want to spend on the cloud and, and, and uh, what's your forecast? The third one is real-time decision making. This is all about uh, catching anomalies, so it's real time. If someone makes a mistake, that's no problem there at all, but you catch it very quickly. Uh, fourth one is cloud rate optimization. So um, this is all about the rate. And if you think about KYG, it's uh, you pay a rate for a cloud service, let's say a virtual machine costs $10 an hour, but the simplest way to save costs is to uh, pre-commit to a spend. In, in Azure, it's called reserved instance, in AWS, it's a committed usage discount, but it's the cheapest way to save money to say, I, I will commit to the cloud vendor to buy X amount over three years. And there's, there's RIs, reserve instances for PMs, Synapse, Databricks, um, all sorts of things. So if you're not using reserve instances, then, then definitely look into it. It's very easy to, to, to set up. Um, there's a few things to consider. Um, it only makes sense <coughs> excuse me, if you're spending a certain amount of money it's not at the low end of the time, it's actually going to be a significant investment uh, to save money. Um, and uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a lot of detail that goes into this, but there's definitely where it's going to start looking. Now, if you think about it, if you've got two different business units or teams in your organization using Databricks, you don't want each of these teams to go to Databricks and, and negotiate a, a rate discount. This is why we have a centralized finance team. They take the buying power of the whole organization and they go to Databricks and say, uh, this is the amount we're going to spend. We're going to buy this amount, they get a much lower discount, and they form that discount out to the business units and let them use it. Um, the fifth domain is cloud usage optimization. So this is the when we think about FinOps, this is what everyone thinks about. This is right-sizing VMs uh, for, the, for the purpose of the workload. Um, turning off orphaned machines. Um, Switching from IaaS to PaaS, so auto scales up and down or scales horizontally. Um, this is the really easy one to understand. It's uh, it's also probably the most fun for engineers. Um, it's all about automation, and it's it's quite possible that you could be in the walk or run phase in this domain already. This is this is one that uh, you know for the most time. And the sixth domain is organizational alignment, and uh, this is all about educating the organization on the values of FinOps, um, getting buy-in from the executive sponsors, uh, educating the engineers on why they're going to be held accountable for their, their cloud spend. Um, 
So that's really important to gain a function done by your second class forms team. Now, in Philos, in the Philos framework, we have different personas and everyone has a role to play. There's the Philos practitioner, which is a, you know, it's a fairly new role because it's come out of the Philos framework. Uh, it's basically someone who's, take, who's taken the, the Philips practitioner exam through the foundation and they understand how to implement the framework. So these are the guys that uh, evangelize the benefits of Philips to the organization and implement the thing that discussed. Your C levels have a role to play. Um, so on the Philips framework, there's a racy matrix that shows you who's accountable, who's responsible, et cetera, et cetera. The C levels have to empower the organization. To adopt Philips. And this is what I was, that story I mentioned earlier where we couldn't get by in to adopt Philips, but it makes so much sense. So I think what we'll see over time is as the messaging spreads about Philips, C levels and excess will start to empower people and say, hey, look into this, I want to optimize our time spent. And again, it's very important to have that point there. Uh, the cloud usage must be aligned with the goals of the organization. That's why we're spending money in the cloud. The business units, uh, the business users and product owners, program managers who are looking after particular business units uh, in the organization, um, they need to they need to now take the information coming back to the Philips team and use that to make data decisions. So you know the iron triangle of um, cost, quality, and time, uh, they can now make the decisions because they have the, the information on cost. They didn't have that before. And uh, the engineering teams or technical people, um, they're the ones that are making the resources. So now they can use the information coming back from the Philips team to make informed decisions. Is it worth spinning up this, this resource or not? And they can feed back to the, the, the product owner who makes the business decision or that that's a, a good investment or not. Then lastly, you have the finance and procurement team uh, who always pay the bills and they're gonna basically use that Visibility on Philips to charge back to different parts of the business and say, You spent this for your business, uh, can I have that money back? Please? Okay, so um, uh, I'm, this is a really high level talk, so I'm going to uh, end it off there. How do you get started if you want to learn more? So I would recommend that you go to the Philips uh, website, look at becoming a practitioner. I think it's a really exciting space, a lot of opportunity. This is an emerging market. It's so new that no one's heard of it, um, but it's coming. So I think you have an opportunity to get ahead of the curve. Uh, there's a Slack channel with 9,000 people on it, and the conversations we have on these channels are amazing. There's about 200 different channels on every single type of thing you can think of. Uh, it's, a, it's a gold mine of information, especially if you're building a, a Philips product, um, and it's very useful. Uh, in your organization, Make your execs aware of FinOps. So if you want to get sponsorship, don't try to go from the bottom like we did. Go to your execs and say, I've heard about FinOps. Give them a, you know, a, a, give them a business proposal, um, explain why you need FinOps, and get buy-in uh, from the execs. The next step then, once you have the buy-in and the empowerment and the budget, you're going to create your cross-functional FinOps team. And you're, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you're going to want to have representations from tech team, the finance team, the business, you know, uh, business leaders, um, because this is a cross-functional uh, concern. And it's all about defining the, what, what does success look like for the FinOps team? What do you want to achieve? Um, you've got to know where you, what your current benchmark is, where you want to be, and measure that you, you succeeded. Uh, you might want to demonstrate uh, quick wins to your execs by looking at low hanging fruit like we did. We lowered the cost by 120k in that business, and that gets people's attention. Um, the, the, the next the next phase of the project is less exciting. There's less wins to make because um, the low hanging fruit is the easy stuff. But uh, you, you want to keep going and start optimizing your rates, optimizing your usage. Implement the financial practices. Really understand those. Um, domains and capabilities as well. Um, it's not a case of you just do one thing. You want, to, you want this to be a cultural change in the organization and then keep measuring and, and uh, um, repeating this uh, to progress. Okay, I'm going to end off here and ask if there are any questions. The questions often yield the most information. Does anyone um, 
Had any experience with this or have any questions that they'd like to ask? <laughs> it's too much. So, um, sorry, it was Arvin, right? Yeah. I had a very interesting chat with Arvin before we started. He's actually starting a role as a first practitioner in a government organization. Um, and that's a sign of the times. This role didn't exist a year ago. So, People are starting to take note of building FedOps teams. Um, I think that uh, it's really early days. Everyone's still trying to figure out what the market's doing, but I think it's a very uh, interesting role to be in. So I'm very keen to stay in touch with the market and see how it goes. So, you've got some questions? Uh, So, question is, uh, how come the data has to be accountable? Or how do they make them Okay, so, yeah, so I think uh, so the question is, how do we, how do we uh, make it so that the engineering teams are accountable? Is that correct? Okay, so, so it's all about visibility. So, currently, we don't have visibility. So, engineers build something. Okay, I'll mention the story that I, I was on another consulting project and this developer uh, had a, there's a, a, a very simple application. It's a grab application for two retail users and he ran on up in six, which cost $5,000 a month. And I said to him, like, why do you run on up in six? It's like, like, it's my key to go to scale. And he just didn't know, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't realize that he was doing it. And then we had this, this is a topic, I'll get back to this. Um, we had this ethical dilemma of how do we tell the client that we just wasted $5,000 on their money? Um, but I only noticed that because I'm curious about cost optimization. Always digging into the horizon. I scale already. Probably because I come from a startup background, we always run things very legally. Um, so but it's about visibility. So you've got to have good reporting and ideally a long detection. I think those are the two key things. It's critical that you're not stopping people in a bank. You don't want to be like Big Brother. You want to say, be aware that everything you do has a cost. There's an educational furniture. I think that's missing. Developers don't think too much about the cost because they never have to. Maybe it's not a fair statement in some direction, but I believe that they don't think too much about the cost because they don't have the cost. Of it. So it doesn't really matter. I think though that's that's the result of the history of being constrained with what you can do, right? So cost hasn't been more considered previously in most organizations because you build your solution and run this off with something that an architect has specified as being sufficient for run this thing in this configuration in this environment. Whereas now it's viable employer on the configuration of things wherever it is kind of Stop doing some of that stuff up front and start to move out. I will deal with it later by putting it on elastic scale or whatever and worry about the cost later where it actually needs to come and needs to come. So I ask the question is I'm quite back to the start of the engagement of the project. And when that when that design has been done, part of that design process has to be a cost estimate of what it's kind of like. And that needs to be, I think it comes back to your number five. <coughs> So that's also that cultural shift and you know, do your point. 
they they do not use it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think. Sorry. But that's why I need to continue. I'll have to go under your point on um cost is not it's a non-functional environment. It's not the wants this environment. So if you think what I would take all the side. Someone comes in with requirements, functional requirements, and I want to do this, 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 this. And uh, they're very concerned about the cost of labor up front length. But no one ever says it must also run under 100,000 a year. Because then you, you test it and go, actually, we see that one functional requirement, but no one says this by that. So, so we're just not considering cost. So that's the shift that needs to happen. Um, and that's the, the, the role of the class team in this, in this framework is to educate people that cost. Should be considered from day one, and that every architectural decision has a cost impact. Um, and then provide the tooling to report on those costs and give visibility and the, the guardrails to catch the mistakes are made. How do you implement it as a process that you set your developers on risk for? You know, that, that's, that's not really a concern now um, because you, know, you, want to, you want to treat your people right. But you've got to make sure that everyone understands that it's no longer that you know a free fall. That you've got to have a cost aware culture. It's um, I think it's the terraform. I think they have like a much like a volume. You can do like a cost estimate on a template. Yeah. Yes, I think it's terraform. It's terraform. It's terraform. It's terraform. That's a really novel idea that you're doing the construction of this code. You actually know what you're going to deploy before you deploy it. You yes. know what that cost looks like on the point. It might not represent operational run costs, but at least you know oh, I'm going to deploy the biggest possible version of machine or whatever it's out or you need to. I can't do that. Yeah. I mean, you can block it elsewhere, but you, you have to build by it because you broke a rule around that. You stop yourself and immediately it's like a build break, right? To build break a different type, you start to bring that visibility right back to the people. Like, oh, I can't specify the gorilla VA because that's not allowed. Yeah, there's one called in infra costs. It could be that same one that ties into the IAIC shows the cost. So it's, it's making the developers aware um, and making it a choice of the size. Um, any questions? Any other questions? Comments? Everyone in the county, please say that's what it is. Yeah, well, I, I guess um, I guess we've seen you know uh, days of plenty, and now the session will make people tighten up the belt. And uh, you know, the, the scary statistic is that thirty percent of cloud spend is actually and it's going to spend the cloud in its pockets. Um, and uh, when the C levels hear that, they're going to start empowering people to to optimize. So. I just want to bring up the simple question now. I have a need that one of the things which you can ask is not possible is the unit economics and how to transition to the FPS economics and the FPS metrics to make decisions of how you see enterprises in the future or management levels. For example, different places to think about the different metrics in the markets, but they are not business, they are not house. Okay, so the question is uh, unit economics. I didn't touch on it because of it's a, it's a more advanced topic. But basically, it's uh, time that you'll spend to something that makes sense to your business. So, if you've got a SaaS product and you're onboarding a customer, um, what is the cost of customer acquisition per customer? Or it could be, uh, what is the cost of units? So, um, your cloud spend as a, as a, uh, um, a ratio of acquisition. Um, and uh, you need to have quite an advanced enough strategy to get that all because you first have to be measuring your cloud spend at a business to the level, and then you can start introducing the economics. Uh, the the idea is bringing this up is because uh, I see a lot of organizations looking to reduce their cloud spend. That's the mandate. They don't think about the volume growth exactly. they're experiencing at the same time. Yes. So it kind of runs counter to the different thinking. Well, that's that's exactly right. But also, it's not about reducing the output. It's about improving the business, return on investment in the business value. You could spend more, but your cost per unit is, is greater. So, that, that's a very good point. Um, and that's part of the awareness from the team, is to educate people on that. Sorry, I'm just going to 
So um, I, I was recently in Cops X, so it's a conference in San Diego. I got back last week. Um, it's the second one. Uh, I wasn't the first one. Uh, so 1,200 people uh, in San Diego, very, very well executed conference. I was really, really impressed with the professionalism from a concept that's been around for two and a half years. They are uh, incredibly on the ball. Um, I, I, I made some put some takeaways. There's a there's a link on the, there's some live streams of the keynotes. Um, there's a few blogs going around about different keynotes. Some of the things that I noticed is that um, the big companies, the Walmart's, Target, the big US companies who are presenting, they've been doing this for a long time. Uh, it's now got a name, um, and there's definitely some things that we thought about, but they have been uh, doing this for a long time. The smaller businesses, the medium businesses have not been. Um, there's definitely a bigger awareness of FinOps in the AWS space than the, the Azure space. Uh, this could be due to the size of the market, but I don't, I don't think so. I don't think the market's that disproportionately different. Um, I, I'm actually not sure what the reason is. And it's really interesting because Azure typically targets business and enterprise, and AWS targets technical. That's a bit of a controversial statement, but uh, Microsoft's very good at capturing uh, business. So um, it's quite interesting that, that that's the case. Um, well, that's a half finished sentence. Uh, um, a lot of vendors in this market. So we, have, we are still at this presentation of about 10 different vendors, Cloud Ability, Cloud Health, Cloud Zero, Cloud Monitor, and Cloud Monitor. Um, and it was very hard to differentiate what the different products did. They all did right sizing, recommendations, only detection, cost visibility. It's just basically taking all the capabilities of the front framework. It was very hard to tell what the difference was. Um, and the, the cost for these tools is really expensive. So a lot of them charge percentage-based costs, uh, which no one likes. Uh, they save you a million, but they, they charge you 50% of that. Um, being multi-cloud is, is a big thing to be taken seriously. As a promised vendor, you have to be able to handle multi-cloud. But we also noticed that um, in a big organization, uh, a lot of departments are given the freedom to choose the best tool that fits their purpose because definitely different tools do different things on and off the cloud. Some tools focus on uh, you know buying set reservations automatically or, or compute settings so ban. Some uh, do spot instances, some do um, DM right sizing. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very interesting. Some do Kubernetes uh, or, or infrastructure costs. Um, and uh, I think that the third point is uh, this is a very, very virgin market. It's so new that no one's heard of it. Um, and again, I want to stress that because there's lots of opportunity here and uh, the, the chance to make a big difference. And I would recommend you go to the next one. It'll be in San Diego as well. Um, so with that, are there any other questions? Uh, that's a great question. How much of the responsibility of the cloud vendors have that they can success? So, um, Simon works for Microsoft, so this could be controversial. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> oh, really? No, not too much. Ah, you need to check LinkedIn more often. Oh, okay, that could be controversial. Go for it. You didn't get any of did you? I did not. Every time you read it, I was in that Um, So, uh, we started, so Cloud Monitor, our product, that, 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 um, this backstory here, uh, we built it because we, were, we have a consulting business and um, the learnings we took from that engagement we turned into a product and we thought there's a market there for lowering costs or optimizing costs. And I knocked on the door, I went to everyone in Microsoft, I was like, guys, people need this, there's a huge market here. And I got no response. And uh, the sellers wouldn't help me, they wouldn't go near me. Um, no one would talk to me about FinOps in Microsoft. And I was talking to AWS counterparts, and they were saying that uh, one of, and this is one of my opinion, 
they have the uh, the of that um, the some of those twelve statements that they didn't die by in AWS. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yes. Um, and one of them is customer obsession. So uh, they they have um, uh, success managers that optimize the cost of customers because they want to do right by the customer, not necessarily make the most money. Um, and suddenly, in March this year, Microsoft joined the Cross Foundation um, as a, a premium partner. So it's 125 a year. They get their name in the, in the lights. Um, and immediately, the, the messaging changed. People reached out to me from Microsoft, and they want me to start having conversations with customers about FinOps. Um, and uh, there's an initiative called Focus, which is, um, I really should know this because I'm in the working group. Uh, I don't know what it's called. But it's basically standardizing the billing model across AWS, uh, Azure, and Google um, so that we're all talking the same language so everyone can do their, their job much easier. Most of the tools we have now are integration pieces to, to standardize things. So, coming to the question is in March this year, I've noticed a big change. Uh, Microsoft now reaching out to their customers and educating them on FinOps. Um, I think that thinking is that if they don't do that, there's a risk that customers will leave for AWS. Um, so, so, I think we'll see this year a big emphasis on FinOps from Microsoft. Yeah, they, they're doing lots of, uh, they've got, um, they've got, uh, is it Azure FinOps link? It's all about uh, more kind of the implementation part of, of FinOps. Um, but yeah, their presence in the FinOps Foundation is massive. So AWS, AWS haven't actually joined as a member, but Google have, um, and there's lots of pressure on AWS to join. But uh, yeah, so I think, I think it will change this year. I think this is the year that the cloud vendors me, have to start uh, educating the market. Do you have a project and they have the job and they are Don't disappear. Don't disappear. Don't leave. Can you use your machine? Yeah. 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 Yeah.